Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here. And today we're gonna to talk about is the business environment. Business environment, what do you mean? Well, when I talk about the business environment, what I'm talking about is kind of the ecosystem that businesses find themselves in. They have their immediate environment, these things they can directly deal with, like who they're gonna hire and who they're gonna work with and how they fight off their competition. But also there's the macro environment, the things that they can either react to or be proactive about, but it's not something that really they can have a lot of impact on. So they're kind of dealing with it. Think about it, the rain and the laws and stuff like that. The companies do have to deal with that in their ecosystem, just like you and me. Think about it, my immediate environment, what I have to deal with, and that I can do with my students, my family, you know, these kind of things, I can deal with that. And, and then I have to think about the weather that I'm dealing with. Yes, I could go inside and film instead of outside in the cold. I can influence these things. And so what I want to talk about today is an idea of how companies are really influenced by the business environment they find themselves. Because if you think about it, for you as a person, the situation you find yourself in will influence a lot. Think about it. If you're watching this at lunchtime, right? What are all the factors that influence your decision on lunch? Well, one, if it's rainy and snowy and cruddy outside, you're like, I'm not going to go out. I'm going to look and see what's, what's inside, what's in the kitchen, or I'm going to order delivery. Or it might be, how do you feel? Or what do you feel like having? Oh, well, you know, I really like Italian food. So maybe I'll go with Italian today. I'm not sure you have those kind of things. Other things you might look at is how much money do you have? Because you don't got much money, you're not going to the fancy restaurant, you're going to go for that value meal at McDonald's. And so you have to realize is that companies kind of are the same way. They have to think about all the things that are going to influence their purchasing, their selling, the products they're going to make, what they need to do. And the thing is, is when you're looking at this environment, we kind of break it into two different parts. You have what's called the immediate environment. These are things that the company can directly influence. I mean, think about it. The, the company can directly influence what they do with their competition. How do we change our prices? How do we make different products in order to compete with them, right? Also, we can look at the different corporate partners we have. Who do we work with? We can do that. Also, we can look at and say, hey, we don't have employees that can do this certain task. We can go and hire people for that. So there's a lot of different parts of that immediate environment that we can really have a big influence on. We can actually directly impact thing. That's not a problem. Well, it is a problem, but these are things we can actually do something with. Like I can make a difference by fighting against my competition. But these outside influences, these macro environmental factors, these are things that are outside of our control. The thing is macro factors affect companies in different ways. I mean, think about it. A ban on smoking would be a legal factor, right? A ban on smoking. Well, does that influence a school? Well, no, because usually little kids aren't smoking, right? But if you're a bar, that will directly impact you, though it's the same law. And so different macro factors will have different impacts on different businesses. And if we look at some of the different macro factors, and each one of these factors, actually, we have a video on, so go look below and you'll see that there's links and stuff like that. Or if you're on our website, Professor Walters, go to the topic three and you'll see all the videos listed and you could do that. But you look at it, you look at the economic macro factors. I mean, if the economy is going well, hey, it's a lot easier for us to sell new products. If the economy is doing poorly, uh-oh, we got some issues there, right? We might look at the demographics. How are those changing? You know, people are having less babies. What does that mean? Oh, there's more old people out there. What does that mean? What do we have to adjust to, right? So you have to think about that. You might look at the legal, political, macroeconomic factors that are out there, the changing laws. How do those laws affect us? Do they affect us? Do they not affect us? It doesn't matter. We still have to know them, right? So you have to do that. You might look at technological factors. I mean, think about how much the internet has changed everything. I mean, your phone that you have in your pocket, or maybe you're watching this, I mean, it's got more power and more computing power than they had going to the moon with the Apollo 11 rockets, okay? And the Saturn V, you're like, wow, that, that's, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, it is, because technology changes. Also, you might look at the natural factors that are out there. Like, look, the weather out here, I mean, that it's really cold. I'm probably not going to film a lot of videos today, right? And businesses have to think about that as well. And also, we're going to look at the cultural factors that are out there or social factors that are out there and how things change. And businesses really have to do one of two things. One, they can react to the changes that are happening in their macro environment. So, oh, a law happens. Okay, we'll put up a no smoking sign. Or they can be proactive and say, hey, look, the Restaurant and Bar Association would like it to be known that we should be allowed to have outdoor smoking areas within 15 feet of the door so our clients that do smoke actually can smoke and come back in the restaurant later instead of having to get into the line again. 
oh, okay. And so they might have a political action committee to kind of influence things or be proactive in that way. So you'll see these things out there. But the thing is these macro factors, I actually have videos on all those. So watch those to get a better idea of each one, okay? And the thing is when we look at this and we say, okay, you got your immediate environment, you got your macro factors. So what does it all mean? Well, for businesses, what it means is firms need to take into account all of these factors when they're looking towards their future and their future business interests. Because if you're in, like, for example, Nokia, they didn't see those technological changes and societal changes that really made it that phones were no longer just a phone. They were a part of our lives. So they didn't have their smartphone out in time. It took them years to put out their smartphone after Apple had basically wiped the market clean of all the smartphone competitors. And so you have to see this because you as a company can't just sit back and say, oh, it'll be fine or complain about the changes. Realize changes happen in the economic situations, the political situations, the environment, all kinds of things. And so for us, for firms have to deal with that because if you can see the demographic changes and you can take advantage of that, that's going to help your business grow. If you see technological changes that can help your business, that can help you grow. You have to think about all this and put it all together because it really isn't just sitting back and not taking advantage of it. That's why you see some universities have really gone all in in for online education, whether it's an online MBA or an online master's or an online undergraduate education. Why? Because the technology allows us to do it, which is fantastic. But the thing is, they're the first ones out there. Some industries, only a few competitors can survive. So if you see these changes coming and you're first on the market, it gives you a better chance to survive. So I hope this helps you know a bit more about that macro environment, immediate environment, and the business environment in general. Do watch our videos, focus on each one of the macro environments, because it's going to tell you a lot more about how companies can really deal with this and issues that they really will see in those macro factors. Anyway, I'll say bye from here in very cold, if I can't feel my fingers anymore, Illinois. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here. And today we're gonna to focus on the task environment or immediate environment. And this is to deal with the kind of pest analysis, you know, when we talk about macroeconomic factors that kind of influence business that we kind of just react to, you know, like political stuff, economic, social, cultural, technological changes, those things, those are outside our sphere. We can only kind of adjust them afterwards. But our immediate environment, our task environment, these are things that we as a company can do something about. We can decide who we hire. We can decide who we work with. We can do our best to fight off our competition. And so these are things we can actually deal with and they also directly affect us. What our competition does directly affects what we can do. And so when we look at this immediate environment, some things that we can direct that directly affect us, what we can actually control. One thing you look at is our capabilities. What are our business? What can our business do? We can figure out what we can do and we can work on that. That's why the one of the things you look at in the in the immediate environment is the labor supply. Okay. The employees we hire, the people that work with us, these kind of things, we're looking at them. We're deciding, hey, if we want to be a better, you know, rebounding basketball team, we're going to draft people that are better rebounders, right? So we're going to look at that. What we have to think about though is, is we have to look at is our available pool of workers will affect our strategy because just because we want to, you know, draft people or add people to our team that can rebound better, well, if there's nobody available that can rebound better, well, we might need to change what we're doing, right? Oh, we can only get three point shooters, then I, we need to change our strategies. We're not gonna be a defense rebounding team. We're gonna be a three point shooting team, right? So we're gonna look at that. And it's so it's like this, if you wanna build bridges, you need to be, you need to hire builders and engineers, right? And so you think about that. And, and the thing is, if there's something you really want that you really need, you're going to have to go out and pay for it. It's not like people walk in because if they have a skill that you really need, you can't just say, I'm gonna pay you this low price. You're gonna to have to pay them better and that's gonna influence you. That's why the best workers get hired away because they look, that person is a transformative force in this business. We want them working for us and so the pay goes higher. So that's gonna influence you. That's why you'll see, you know, the best players in the league get paid a lot, a lot of money and the average players get paid a lot less because having LeBron, having Steph Curry makes a lot bigger difference than having, you know, Judd Bushler or somebody like that, right? And so you have to think about that. And the 
thing is, when you're looking at your labor supply, that is really things that, like, the capabilities they have, we can kind of control, control that. And if we don't have these capabilities in our labor supply, we can train them up and help them learn, right? And so that can help us out. So we can control it that way. Now, another thing you have to look at in our immediate environment is our customers, right? I mean, your customers, you can deal with them. You can talk to them. You can give them a better deal. You can send a better sales representative there. I mean... How many of you thought you'd go to the university you're at from the day you were born? You didn't. You went on a visit, you met the people there, you talked to the advisors, and they sold it to you, right? And they said, that's why I wanna to go to this university. Well, when you're dealing with your customers, your sales approach is something you can deal with because we really have to focus on our customers because our customers really determine our success. If we have customers, yay, we make money and survive. If we don't have customers, we got some problems. And so that's why it's important you do your research, you understand what they're wants and demands are you know that wants and demands comes up a lot in marketing right you know those things and you try to deliver on those things but you have to realize the type of products you're you're making will determine the demand you know like if you're making ketchup like you don't have a you don't eat ketchup as the main meal, right? You are, if they buy hot dogs, you're going along with it. If you're making hamburgers, you go along with it, right? So the type of product you make will influence your demand. And so we have to think about that because there's a difference between that final demand and the derived demand. Like the final demand is I want a hot dog, but our demand is derived from hot dog sales. It's like tires. The number of tires sold depends on how many cars people are buying. You don't buy eight car tires for your car, you buy four tires and maybe a spare, so five for your car, right? So you think about that. Also, if you look at your customers, you might like look at it in terms of, are they buying, you know, producer goods versus consumer goods? I mean, think about it. You buy a toaster for yourself. Hey, it just has to toast two pieces of toast. But if you're, you know, buying a toaster for, you know, Waffle House, man, you got to go through a lot of toasts when you're there. So that's going to influence what your customers are buying, how they're going to buy. And so you have to adjust to that. Also, you might look at it in terms of the type of product they're buying in terms of durable goods versus perishable goods. You know, if you're buying something that's going to last for 20 years, it's going to be different how you're going to sell to them versus something they eat right away and it's gone. And so we really have to think about these things because demand from your customers can vary greatly depending on you know, what they want and what they need and what you're selling. So we really have to put that in there, but that's things you can really control. Another thing you can control are your suppliers. You can choose who you work with. Okay. Like if, look, look, if I want my burger joint to seem like it's better, I'm going to go find a better farmer that has better beef, right? Or better cheese. And I'm going to use that. And that's why you can control your suppliers. Cause if you think about it, you as a student, don't you choose who supplies your co-work uh, in projects, just be like, no, I don't want to work with them because they never do any work in the projects. I mean, we all have friends that do that. And, and if you don't have a friend that doesn't do the work of the project, you're probably that friend that doesn't do it. And the thing is with your suppliers, you might be looking at your long-term costs with them, versus your short-term costs, how they can deliver to you, when they can deliver to you. Because if you're doing just-in-time production, it's going to be very different. They have a big warehouse holding everything. And so that's going to influence you. And that's something you can actually decide, hey, is it worth the opportunity, opportunity cost for me to work with them versus somebody else? Yes or no? You have to take that into account. And then of course, you have your competition. And your competition, I mean, your competition can kill you. Your competition also can inspire you to do better. I mean, how iPhone killed all that competition, like Nokia and stuff, it also inspired Samsung to come out with a better phone. And so we have the Galaxy out there, right? And for all those Amazon competition that, that you know, people say it's driving them out of business, but you know what? They learned and like other businesses learned, wait, we can also do online e-commerce and we can survive. So your competition can drive you. You have to compete with them. You got to figure out how do I beat Amazon at their own game? What can I do, right? And so we take that into consideration. And if you look at your competition, you're looking at, hey, you know, what's our history? Is this one of those we fight? to the last dollar kind of competition stuff so i know i gotta fight with everything we're having price wars all the time or is it one of these things that hey i can have different pricing strategies i could be the high end and they could be the medium end or they could be the low and i could be the high whatever you think about these and you can adjust because look mcdonald's comes out with a dollar menu you better believe everybody else is going to come out their competition going to come out is with some other value meals as well because they know look our competition's done that 
we have to adjust. So you don't just sit back and let your competition beat you up. You have to do something, okay? And so that's why it's really important when you look at the task environment, the immediate environment, there's so many things going on that really directly affect your business. You need to pay attention to it and you need to be doing something about it. You need to be having strategies to keep up with your the best labor practices and how to keep up with your competition and beat them and, and, and how to deal with your suppliers and find the right ones out there and, and training up your people and, and figuring out your customers and think about their demand is it elastic demand like if we change the price a little it'll go up or down or is it inelastic no matter what we charge they're gonna buy it I mean we have to think about that and know that so we can fight on it and do a better job because some things those macro factors we talked about you know in the other videos the political and economic and social those things hey we're just riding the wave with them we're just trying to surf it the best we can this one we can build that dam to stop our competition we can choose the people who work with us to help fight through these things we can do that in our immediate environment okay now it's called immediate environment or 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 task environment depending which way you look at the model so i just want to let you know that anyway i wish you all the best and i'll say bye Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're gonna to continue our conversation on the pest analysis, looking at the macro environmental factors that influence business. And today we're gonna to talk about is probably the most impactful macro factor out there that will influence business, and that's the economy. I mean, look, if the economy's going well, business is a lot easier. We're not negotiating as much, people are buying more things, it's just a lot easier to do business. When the economy is down and it's tough times, man, and you got more loss that you got to deal with. You got more people not being able to pay their bills. You got less customers. Uh, it's a really tough time paying your own bills. There's a lot of things you have to think about as a business, as a company, because look, the economy has ruined great companies. The economy, I mean, one of the things they say, economy will take down any president or any king because if people don't have jobs, they're like, hey, I don't have a job. I need someone else to help me out here. You know, and you think about that. This is a really big issue that businesses have to think about. And so what I'm going to talk about are some of the economic factors that businesses do need to look at uh, when, when they're looking at these macro factors. And that's why you say is what's the market like? What is the economy like? Is it booming? Is it busting? What's going on? It's going to have a dramatic effect on things. When the, when the stock market's going up, people feel like the economy is going well. They're spending more money. When the stock market's tanking, they're like, oh, I don't know if I should spend money that way. Think about it. Unemployment. If you're not sure about your job, which is in a bad economy, usually those things, usually people are higher unemployment rate. We have issues. And then people are like, look, if I'm not sure if I'm going to have a job tomorrow, and am I, gonna, am I gonna buy that car today? Am I gonna buy that house today? Am I gonna go on that vacation today? No, and so maybe I'm not gonna purchase now. And that impact is something that businesses have to think about. Right now, hey, people are not going on vacations. People are not buying cars. So what can Ford do? What can you know the travel companies do to get people to start traveling again? We have to think about strategies to mitigate these problems. So with COVID and all this stuff, the economic collapse and no one's traveling anymore, that is also, I mean, that's a health thing, but also if you look in terms of econ economics, you know, when you're when you're flying 80% less passengers, man, the, you can't stay in business. So what do we need to do? We need to like United, they're mortgaging off their, their frequent flyer programs to get some cash so they can pay the bills. I mean, these are things you have to think about because it's tough economic times will influence what you can and can't do. I mean, that's why when things are good, it was easier to ask your parents for another Nintendo game. But when economic times are bad, they're like, hey, um, we need to kind of, we need to save some money right now. And so you think about that in your own life. You have seen it. And that's why you have to realize in financial crises, it's going to be different. Like the 2008-9 financial crisis, banks got hit. Because what was the thing that was tanking? Oh, all those bad loans were coming due and they, no one was paying them. So the banks got hit really hard. But then Walmart and Aldi during the last financial crisis, I mean, I think they did okay because people started, instead of going to the more expensive grocery stores and stuff, they started going to Walmart. They started going to Aldi to save the money because they had less to spend or they didn't want to spend as much. So it's really kind of interesting how bad economic times will have different impacts on different businesses and the magnitude of how much it hurts. Like bad economic times hurt universities, but also help universities because one, bad economic times, people are losing their job, people go back to school to learn again. So hey, the master's programs numbers kick up. But if you're a public school and the 
people aren't as many people have jobs and aren't paying taxes to fill the coffers of the state well then the public university gets less money from the government uh oh we have a problem there okay so what's our plan to mitigate these risks and so businesses will do that figure out a way like i know university of illinois their business school they took out an insurance plan in case something like this happens just in case they can get through it so we really have to look at that because even if your business is doing well in the tougher times you might not want to advertise your s-class fancy mercedes a lot you might want to focus more on your a-class or m-class mercedes which is more of an affordable price point all right and so if you look at different economic things you know, if you look at you know fluctuations in the GDP you know I mean it can have a big impact because people overall feel if we have more money or less money and for businesses one business itself cannot jumpstart the economy and but the thing is is we all can be suffering from a bad economy so we have to think about the psychological impact of a fast growing you know stock market or a improving GDP or decreasing GDP or a dropping stock market that all goes into there and and so we'll see in the economic sense you might look at it in terms of changes in government spending now if we have a, a one trillion dollar stimulus package hey that's putting a trillion dollars into the economy that people can spend on certain goods hey what does that mean well if I'm Walmart that means more people are gonna come in and stock up on their staples things they need to have but for other businesses that might mean oh people are gonna have a little extra money so maybe instead of, you know, they weren't going to buy a car, maybe they will. So I'm going to advertise the lower price car to get people through the doors. Other thing you might look at, changes in tax rates. I mean, think about it. If you, you if you see that, oh, they lower our taxes, that means I have more money to spend. Or if they raise the taxes, people might be spending even less. I mean, have you ever noticed when it's around tax season, uh, they'll be like, oh, use your tax refund to buy a refrigerator. Use your tax refund for the down payment on your new car they know these things happen so that might influence our business also you might look at uh, exchange rates and how they fluctuate that could be a big deal that influences businesses especially internationally because if it's if your currency and, and the other currency are one to one hey we can charge a hundred for it but if one of the currencies drops a lot I'm still charging 100 for my product, but the other place, that means it's 140. Or if the exchange rate goes the other way and the other economy gets stronger and your gets weaker, then you're only charging, it's 98. And you're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? You have all these fluctuations you have to take into account too. So there's a lot of economic factors out there that companies really need to think about that they can't directly control but they do need to think about, hey, what do we do to avoid these problems or at least mitigate these issues or take advantage of these opportunities? So I hope this helps you out and I wish you all the best. Bye. Hey, the fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in New Orleans, Louisiana, and today we're gonna to talk about is the legal or political environment that businesses have to deal with. And this goes along with our talk about the macro environmental factors that businesses have to deal with in their business environment. Because the thing is, is there's different laws and regulations that every business has to take into, a, you know, into account when they're doing business. Now, the thing is, some political things, some legal things affect some businesses more than other businesses. Think about it a ban on smoking how does that affect places well if you're here in in New Orleans and you're a bar on Bourbon Street that's gonna really affect you because people like to drink and smoke at the same time and therefore they have to go out that means they're not drinking my beer in my store they're going someplace else we got a problem right and so you kind of think about that but the thing is some businesses are directly affected like those bars but also we have to think about those businesses that are indirectly affected by these legal things okay for example if you're a business that has a lot of people that actually smoke look I'm an office building what does that have to do with with cigarette bans well if a lot of your workers smoke and they have to go outside is it a long hallway then 10 floors down in an elevator then go outside 15 feet away from the door then smoke there then come back in I mean if they're smoking half a pack a day how many hours of work time are you losing from them working and so there's things you have to think about is how do I adjust that? Do I say workers have to clock out for their cigarette breaks or do we need to build a smoking room or what do we need to do? And so you have to think about those things because each legal or regulation change or something like that can have an impact. So a fair trade law that might open up more, more competition to you or it might open more opportunities to you or it might do nothing. But we always have to kind of think about that, okay? Now, when we look at these laws, what I really want you to think about is when some of them are actually made specifically for an industry, that industry really has to know. And so that's where you might have the reactive versus proactive kind of stuff when it's macro factors, because we see, oh, there's a law that's really gonna affect us, maybe we should do something about it. 
and you try to be proactive. You talk to your congressman, your senator, you have those political action committees or whatever, the lobbyists that go and talk for different things, right? That's why you have all these organizational groups, whether you're in food or you're in hotels or whatever, you're gonna have a group that's talking to the legal people, try to influence it. Hey, this is what's gonna affect our business. We don't wanna lose jobs. What can we do? How can we work things out? And they do those things to kind of be proactive on there. Now, some companies are just reactive. Okay, there's a new law out there. We have to do something to match up with it. Because though some of these laws are for general stuff and some are very specific, we as a business cannot act like we don't know them because we can still get in trouble for not following the law, okay? So for example, if you're here as a tourist in New Orleans and you're on Bourbon Street, yes, you can walk around and drink your beer and stuff in a plastic thing, not a glass bottle, okay? You don't wanna get in trouble for those kind of things. Or, you know, some people think, oh, it's anywhere I go in New Orleans, I can drink with open container stuff, I'm fine. Well, can you really do that everywhere in New Orleans or is it only in the French Quarter? You're not sure, right? So, oh, maybe I should figure this out so I don't get in trouble other places. So I hope this helps you kind of understand the overall idea behind that kind of political, legal, regulatory environment when it comes to this kind of macro environmental analysis. So I wish you all the best and have a good time here in New Orleans or wherever you're at. Bye. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here. And today we're gonna to continue our discussion on macro environmental factors, looking at how social trends can really impact our business. Because if you think about it, social trends in society can have a massive impact in terms of the products we offer, right? Or the prices we charge, or the things we wanna focus on, our new product development. There's all kinds of things out there. And we as businesses have to keep track of what's cool and what's not cool because do i can i sell bell bottoms again is the jean jacket making a comeback i don't know i need to know society let me know so i can make sure i have products that really fit with that okay and the thing is depending on where you are your location what you're doing your industry societal trends will have a bigger impact or a smaller impact okay and so what i want to kind of go through today are some of the social impacts that in social trends we're seeing more in society that businesses really need to make sure they're focusing on so they don't miss out all right, and so one thing you wanna look at is now, in the US at least, you're having much more what we call a time poor society. We don't have a lot of time. I mean, think about it. Now, whether you live in a big city or a small town, you might live farther and farther out, so you got a longer and longer drive home from work and to work. You know, maybe you're taking an hour long train into the city for work, and that's two hours a day, you don't get back, right? So I've got my eight to 10 hours of work, plus two hours of driving, that's 12 hours of the day. Plus I gotta sleep a little bit, right? But then I also do my housework, I gotta do this other stuff. I, there's just not enough hours in the day. How many of you feel like that? And the thing is companies see that we're getting less and less time to be free. And so companies have had to adjust to that, all right? So you're seeing less socializing. People are going out less and less talking to themselves. Like I'm here at Washington Park in Quincy and I'm seeing all these people walking around with their phones like this. They're doing their, their maybe their Pokemon Go, I don't know. They're doing something. And But the thing is socializing has changed. You're not having as much face-to-face. -face. You're seeing much more people socializing via phones. Think about it. How many of you would rather text someone than call them? That's a social trend we have to think about, right? And part of it's that time poor society. Who's got time for that phone call? A quick text saves me a lot of time. So we kind of think about that, right? Also, with that less and less time, there's also less time for vacations, right? So if we do do a vacation, I wanna get as much as I can out of it, that whole fear of missing out. And that's why you're seeing cruises and stuff like that really hammer home. Look, you don't have a lot of time. We can get you to a lot of different ports so you can see a lot of different places, right? So you're not missing out. And so they do that. But the other side of things, you might see it in terms of restaurants. How many of you have gone to the grocery store and you saw one of your restaurant chains you go to actually has food in the grocery store? Maybe you're getting your PF Chang's, right? They have a frozen version of that. I personally like the uh, potato skins from Fridays. Guess what? You can buy the potato skins in the frozen food section in Fridays. Because what you see is consumers have less and less time, so I don't have time to go to the restaurant. I don't have time to go out to eat. I gotta get home because I'm tired. And so restaurants have made it so, hey, you can buy that food and make it at home. 
Starbucks. You can buy your Starbucks and make it at home. Ever wonder why you have all these Uber Eats and all those kind of things? Because restaurants saw people are having less and less time. We got to make it so our restaurant can be an option for those people that don't have time. So you're seeing all those things out there. If you're looking at Netflix, who has time to go to Blockbuster and look around? You don't even have to get out of your pajamas. You can come home from work, put on your PJs, get in bed, Netflix and chill. Hey, baby, you know, you can do whatever. And so we're seeing how this time poor society thing is really influencing businesses, how they're creating things and stuff like that. Now, another societal trend you're seeing a lot is health and wellness. So you're seeing like the crunch fitnesses and the planet fitnesses popping up all over the place. The YMCA is announcing all their, their classes and things like that. Now you can do your workouts online. You can go to YouTube and there's plenty of YouTubers that are doing yoga and Pilates and all kinds of stuff. You can do all that. I mean, part of that, if you think about it, the Time Poor Society, part of that goes in there. We don't have a lot of time. That's why they're 24 hour gyms, but people are looking to be more healthy. So you're having more of those things, but also you're having less genetically modified stuff. GMOs are going down. You're seeing more organic produce. Think about it. Five years ago, if you wanted organic food, where did you have to go? You had to go to a special store that only had organic stuff. Now the organic food is just in the normal aisle at Walmart because society has really kind of pushed for those things. So you're seeing more and more of that, all right? Other things you might see is people are worried about different sicknesses and stuff like that. How many of you have taken your Purell or you've taken the little anti-back stuff and done washed your hands that way sometimes? We're seeing society that way, so we're making more things. You'll see there's wipes that you can wipe down your screen on your airplane and the, and the, the, the tables and stuff like that. They have those things because people are scared about that. We see society is caring about that. Now, another thing that's kind of important that I think that a lot of people don't really realize is the privacy concerns are out there. More and more people are noticing how much are all those websites tracking me? What, what do they know about me? How many times have you been looking on Amazon or looking on eBay and then you go to some other website like Facebook and there's that product you were just looking at staring right back at you like, Facebook, are you tracking me? Well, I don't know if Facebook is, but that ad profile is. And so we start seeing those things. So people really get worried, how, wondering how much data do they have on me? What do they have? That's why you'll see all these like privacy statements and stuff like that. You have to accept the cookies. Do you allow us to do all, uh, track all this information on you from our app? All those kind of things. You're seeing people get more and more worried about that. And one of the things you probably see in your life, have you ever had to get a new credit card or a new debit card because some place where you did business had their credit card information stolen? We get worried about those things. So we got to think about we as a business, how do we protect people's information? Do we just not collect anything? What do we do? And so that's going to influence different businesses that are out there. Now, another thing I think is very important, and you're seeing this a lot more in society, is more the green or environmentally friendly side of society or more a sustainability aspect of businesses. People want to make sure, like, do I really need all this extra plastic? Do I need all this extra packaging and things like that? Do we really need to have all the plastic straws and things like this? You're seeing people getting more and more concerned with that, right? And so we have to ask ourselves as a business, do we put the, do we give everybody a plastic straw or do we give them a lid they can drink out of? Or do we not have straws at all? Or do we only give out straws when people ask for them? These are the kind of things you have to think about. And the thing is, it can be all kinds of stuff. Maybe it's reducing the waste you have. Maybe it is reusing some of the products you, you come up with, you know, like ricotta cheese is just recooked cheese. It's like, oh, we've recycled the stuff from our cheeses that didn't make it into cheese to make it into ricotta. Yeah, you have that. Or maybe you find ways to like, reduce in terms of, hey, could we make this more sustainable? Like, could we make it easier for people to refill their products? How many of you now are using reusable water bottles, right? And now you see water fountains that have the old fashioned push button you drink here, but then also they have it where you put your bottle in there and it fills that up for you. You have those things as well. And so you do have this kind of environmental sustainability kind of stuff you have to think about, right? Recycling, all kinds of stuff like that. And so you're seeing businesses are putting a lot more effort to show this is what we're doing to be more sustainable. Sustainable. This is what we're trying to do to be better. I know the university I work at, they have a whole solar field, right? And they're putting more solar fields up because I look, our goal is by 2050 to be, you know, net neutral or carbon neutral or stuff like that. They're doing those things to show that that's our commitment. We know it's important to you students and you that are, you know, working with our university and it's important to us. So we're going to do stuff for that.
Now another societal trend you're seeing is more price sensitivity because when you have uncertainty in terms of, am I gonna have a job tomorrow? Is the economy gonna be good? Is the economy gonna be bad? I don't really know. You get more price sensitive. I don't necessarily wanna spend a lot if I'm not sure if I'm gonna have the money to pay for it the next day, okay? And so when you have this uncertainty, you start seeing differences in terms of how people pay what they buy, things like that. Because when you have a social trend of uncertainty, then people aren't trying really new products because hey, if I'm not sure if this is gonna work, do I waste my money on it? So that might influence things. So luxury brands, what you'll see is when there's tough economic times, which kind of goes in the economic side of it, you'll see them always saying, look, here's our, you're gonna save money in your gas bill. You're gonna save money in you know less mechanical work, stuff like that. You see those kind of things and you see companies really trying to go for a better deal. It's like, look, yes, you're paying money, but it's buy one, get one free. So when you come, you get a great deal with us and so you're seeing that kind of influence and then of course you can look at the old reason why I'm doing this is the celebrity focus of society I mean think about it how many reality TV shows are there out there I mean anybody can be a star anybody can start a YouTube channel and make videos about making marketing and stuff like that but I want mine to be super famous because society in general has kind of a celebrity focus now everybody can get their 15 minutes of fame whether it's a viral video or a viral picture or a funny meme i mean think about it how many of you will track when i put up an instagram photo how many likes i get right people track those things and so we see that and so you'll see companies like i fly with delta airlines a lot right and so they have this hashtag sky miles life and if you use the sky miles life they might actually share your picture wouldn't that be cool i got shared by delta da, 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 da. and so you have that kind of like celebrity focus that's out there. So what does that mean? How does that influence our business? Well, maybe we might have our advertising more focused on how our products help you get to that celebrity side of things or how it helps you become the star of the show or something like that. And so you see a lot of different things out there because it's not just here, want a selfie stick? There's other stuff to it. I mean, think about your phones, right? Because before, if you, if you wanted a selfie, you had to ask somebody to take your picture. Then they put a camera on the front. Now there's video on the front. Now there's a flash on the front. Now there's multiple lenses for that selfie so I can have the you know portrait selfie and stuff like that. They do that because society is going that way. And the thing is, there's a lot of different societal influence or societal trends or social trends that companies have to think about. And it can very much be a very much location by location thing. It might not be the entire country. And that's why this kind of goes over to that cultural side, which we have a video on the macro factors of culture. You might see those things there, okay? So you wanna kind of look at that because honestly, doing you know the, the societal factors in a small town in Illinois might be very different than going to Chicago, which is also in Illinois. So you have to kind of look at those things. So businesses really are focusing on a lot of different societal changes in a lot of different places at the same time. Hence why when you travel, sometimes you'll see the same product, but they might package it or sell it in a different way. Anyway, I hope this helps you know a little bit more about societal trends and changes and how businesses need to adjust. And I wish you all the best. And I'll say bye from here in Quincy, Illinois. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here and today we're here in Illinois, frosty, cold, freezing cold Illinois. And today we're going to talk about is macro environmental factors focusing on the natural environment because this is one of those macro factors these are factors that are out of your company's control. You know, you just kind of adjust to the weather. I can't control the weather. I just have to deal with it. And it's a little too cold right now for a t-shirt. So what I'm going to do <laughs> is I'm going to put a jacket on. And that's the thing is companies have to look at that too. What is the physical weather that we're going to have to deal with in the place we're looking to do business? So if I'm Domino's, don't I need to see what the uh, weather is going to be tonight? Because if I know, oh, there's going to be a lot of rain or there's going to be a lot of snow, one, people probably are not going to go out to eat, right? So they're going to order more. Ah, so that might have more influence on me, right? But I can't control the weather. I just have to adjust to it. So you have to think about those things. Another thing you might look at in terms of physical weather, you know, if you think about the physical environment here in Illinois, there, there's no beach, so I'm not going to put a beach shop. You're not going to see an uh, Ocean Pacific store or, or a, you know, a, a Billabong store or something like that because you're not going surfing here, okay? So you're kind of thinking about those things. And the thing is, you're going to look at all kinds of natural phenomenons in this natural environment. Earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, these kind of things are really going to influence your business. Because think about it, if you're in tourism in the Caribbean, you know that hurricane season is July to November. So you're going to have to make sure that you have, you know, 
contingency plans if a, if a hurricane comes through what do i do with the tours if it hits while tourists are here these kind of things we have to plan around that whereas uh, if you're up here in the midwest they have to think about the winter weather don't they because if we're a factory we have to make sure we get our shipments in and out and if there could be big snowstorms well that could influence as well that's why some companies have moved their production to the southern part of the u.s because the weather is better more you know consistent and the roads are always open they're not iced over that's going to influence things if you're looking at earthquakes and tsunamis and stuff like that do i put my nuclear plant over an earthquake fault of course not you don't want to do those kind of things and so you have to think about that and the thing is though it's not just kind of the the physical environment you're looking at you also might look at just pollution levels in general how is that going to influence you now you may ask mark why why are you standing in a cornfield or, or whatever field this is well think about organic farming for them, pollution levels are very important. That land behind me has got to be fertile. It's got to be good to plant it. It cannot have any waste materials that run over on that. Otherwise, I don't have organic peas and corn and soybeans and stuff like that. And so those pollution levels can influence where you're going to plant, what you can plant and things like that. So you can get organic certified. On the other side of things, if you look at your favorite YouTubers, pollution levels could influence them. I know for me, a few years ago I was filming and there was a lot of pollution where we were filming, like so much pollution that it sounded like I was packing a <laughs> it sounded like I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. I've never smoked, just letting you know. But it was crazy because I'm like, oh my God, how are you doing today? I'm like, mm, drink some water. And what usually take me five minutes to film a video was taking me 10. Well, what does that mean? Well, if I'm gonna be going back there, I'm not gonna to try to film 20 videos, I'm gonna to try to film 10 videos because I can't get as much done. So maybe I don't film there. And so we have to think about these kind of things. Other thing you might look at in terms of the natural environment, increased government regulation. Think about the EPA in the US and Europe, they have their own environmental regulations. How can we adjust for them? What do we need to change for that? And what you see, unfortunately, is some companies will leave the country to go to a place that has lower regulations for the environment and so you see that and so you can see that influence out there and of course if we look at it in general if you look at how kind of a social change and the natural environment kind of come across we might look at the increased importance of sustainability I mean think about it how can we cut our waste what can we do to have le less, you know, leftover product? If, you, if you're an old person watching this, you might remember buying a CD, which now comes in a jewel case like this. They used to come in a long box like this, right? And you're like, wow, that's a lot of extra waste. What can we do to cut that out? What can we do to eliminate that? That can influence you as well. And we might be looking at how can we reuse some of our waste products? Maybe we can turn it in to something else. So for making our car, right? We have this extra steel left over. Is there something else we can make with that steel? Okay, so we're trying to figure out different ways that we could really be more sustainable as a business because the natural environment really is a big influence on businesses in a positive way and also in a negative way in terms of what we have to deal with and stuff like that. And so firms really need to take that into effect and adjust to it, okay? So I hope this helps you understand a little bit more about the macro effect of the natural environment on businesses. If you want some more, there's a bunch of other macroeconomic effects that you can watch. Bye. Hey, the fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Tazumal in El Salvador. This is actually the most important Mayan site they have here in El Salvador that they've uncovered, and it's fantastic. And it got me really learning a lot about the Mayan culture, and it helped me realize that there's another macro factor that companies have to think about when they're doing business. They have to think about the cultural factor of where they're going to go. For example, the Mayans here, when there was a new government, they would actually completely cover all the buildings from the old government and then build new buildings on top of that. So how would that influence that culture? Well, if you're in the building trades, that would be great because you get to build all the time. But if you're an artist, you're like, wait, my artwork is gonna disappear when it gets covered over again. So people will be affected in different ways. And so we as businesses have to think about the cultures in the countries we're gonna be working in. Because culture really is how groups kind of define themselves. If you think about all the different things that make up a culture, whether it's their language or religion or beliefs, these kind of things, you take that together and think, how is that going to influence how business works? Is it in terms of religion? Is it what day of the week are we closed? Is it Friday? Is it Saturday? Is it Sunday? Is it no days? Because religion isn't as important. We have to think about that because that will influence our business. 
Also, we might look at is how our product can identify with the culture that we're selling it in. So for example, here in El Salvador, there's so many really great fruits here. It's fantastic. And so companies like Coca-Cola, when they're making sodas for here in El Salvador, they realize that we need to have more fruity flavors. So there's actually a lot more kind of Fanta fruit flavors for soda choices here than there are in other countries, like in the US. Because we think about how culture influences us. It could be the product offerings we have. It could be in the sizes we have are on order. I mean, think about it. In the US, you have a lot of uh, 2XLs, 3XL shirts. Because of the culture, there's a lot bigger people, right? Whereas other places, you have smaller people. If you go to, for example, we were in Peru and we're walking around and I needed a new pair of shoes. There were no shoes my size that were there because in that culture, people did not have big size feet. And so you have these kind of things you have to think about. And we start looking at cultures, there are kind of two ways you look at it. One is a country culture and one is a regional culture. So a country culture, we want to take into account the overall country's culture that's there. That's where maybe religion comes or things like that. So McDonald's, they have to take into account that cows are sacred animals in India. So they don't have hamburgers there. They have more chicken things. Just like you wouldn't have a McJesus burger in the US, you wouldn't have a beef burger in India. And so we take that into account. Or maybe you want to look at toothpaste. I mean, one of the things that's fun is we go around the world we find different flavors of toothpaste depending where we go and you'll see some places they like spicy toothpastes some places like minty freshness other ones think if it doesn't taste like medicine it must be just candy and it makes your teeth even worse and so companies have to know how that culture feels about their toothpaste because that will influence things as well and when we start looking at regional cultures we're starting to focus down in smaller parts so for example if you're in a university town you know that every single store is going to have that university colors whether it's orange and blue or garlic and gold or silver and black or whatever they have those university colors and so they're going to focus on their university that's why if you're in a university town i'm going to guess there's some kind of like university street or university avenue and there's going to be you know like some kind of university hall that is going to be the university pub or something that relates to that because in that region that's what the important thing of their culture is another thing you might look at in terms of product offerings in this in the u.s in the south you have a lot more sweet tea that's what they have on offer if you go to other parts like where we live in illinois you ask for sweet tea they're like oh we have normal tea and some sugar and i'm like oh bless your heart that is not the same thing and we realize is each one of these different regions within the country might have its own thing but my favorite regional difference to talk about when i go to the u.s i ask you in the comments below what do you call soda do you call it soda? Do you call it pop? Do you call it soda pop? Do you call it soda pop? Do you just call it Coke and then you order a Sprite after you order a Coke? That's a regional difference. So think about a company like McDonald's. Do they say, here's our sodas, here's our pops, here's our, what do we do? What do they say? Here's our beverages, okay? So you wanna kind of think about those things. Whereas if it's a store that wants to really be known by its region, well, hey, if we're gonna be a real Southern store, we're gonna say we have Coke and then you can choose what kind of Coke you want. Do you want Sprite? Do you want Fanta? Do you want Coke? These kind of things. Because the thing is, culture can have a really great influence on your business, but you need to know about that culture because it's gonna affect you in a lot of different ways, in your product offerings, how you advertise, the size, the designs, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, I wanna say bye from here in El Salvador, a fantastic place to visit, really loved it, and I'm enjoying the culture here and can't wait to have some more of those tasty, different fruity flavors of Fanta. Bye from El Salvador. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in El Salvador to continue our discussion on macro environmental factors and how businesses really have to see these things so they can adjust to it to be a success in the future. And the topic we're gonna to talk about today are demographics. So if you're thinking about demographics, this is basically how society and our groups can be divided up. So you might look at it in terms of age, right? Or you might look at it in terms of life cycle, where people are in their lives. You might look at income. You might look at religion, which kind of crosses over the culture thing as well. And you'll see in these macro factors, sometimes things cross over in different ways, but you're kind of looking at it in terms of when you click through the TV and you know, you're going through the cable channels, you ever notice that when you watch CNBC or MSNBC, there's a lot of things about erectile dysfunction. Why? Well, because it's mostly males over the age of 50 that have money to pay for these things. That's what they're looking for. The demographic we're targeting is males with the money to pay for this that probably you're having a little <clears throat> issue going on. Hey, that's going to work. But then when you switch it over to Cartoon Network and they've got, hey, Barbie's newest toys or the new G.I. Joe or Transformers are out. 
they're doing that because they know that demographic, that age group is watching that, okay? And so what I wanna kinda of go through is look at some of the typical demographics you might look at in order to figure out is, hey, how are things changing, all right? So if we look at something basic like age, now you have your generations that are go through here, but so we look at back in the early 40s, there wasn't a lot of babies being born. Why? Because a high percentage of the male population was out at the war. So there was nobody there to make babies with the other people to make babies, right? And so you think about that and go, right, that's true. But then what happened after that? 1945, war is over. Guess what? Baby boom. Babies start flying out all over the place. And so you have the hugest increase in the number of births in the US or around the world ever in human history. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we gotta have more diapers, right? At right away, it's more diapers in 1945, you know, through 1960 or whatever. But also, what else does that mean? That means, oh, we need some more schools. We need more preschools. And then we need more kindergartens. And we need more elementary schools. We need more high schools. We need more colleges. How many of you, if you're watching this from the US, went to a high school that was built in the 60s or 70s? That's straight from the baby boom. We have to adjust to that. And now that the boomers are getting to retirement age, what does that mean? Oh, we need more retirement homes. We need more cancer centers, all this kind of stuff. We follow that through. And so businesses can take advantage of that. If we see there's a lot of people that are getting older, well, what's one thing older people don't wanna do? Get older. So what do we do? I don't want glasses, I want LASIK. I want contact lenses so I look younger. I want hair club for men so I don't look as bald or I can paint my beard so it doesn't look as salty. There's a little pepper and a little salt in there, things like that. And so we see companies have taken advantage of this changing demographic, okay? And for different countries, there's different demographics you think about. If you look at Japan, very low birth rate, what does that mean, all right? And so other countries, very high birth rate, what does that mean? We have to figure these things out, okay? Because there really are a lot of demographic factors you have to kind of go into. You might look at income, okay? So if we're looking at different incomes, well, do we develop cars because there's enough people in that income bracket that can support us? So that's why when you have companies like Toyota, they come up with their Lexus brand because they see, look, there's a enough people that can pay for the Lexus brand, the higher end brand than in other places where we might only have the Toyota brand. And the thing is, if you're looking at income I and mean, we think about it, I need these new glasses, but if there's rough economic times or there's uncertain economic times, the demographic of income becomes uncertain. Am I going to go buy new glasses? No, no, I'm going to be okay right here until I know my income is going to be stable, right? So that might influence things as well. Now, another thing you might look at in terms of demographics is education. If we see we have a high level of education, well, maybe that determines how we advertise to a certain demographic, right? The thing is, if you're going to a place that doesn't have the, let's say, financial background, they don't understand the importance of what banking can do for them or retirement planning can do for them. Well, you know what? Maybe what we need to do is focus on different things. I mean, think Think about it. When you're in your 40s, you're like, yeah, I really need to think about life insurance and, and retirement. But when you're 20, do you care about retirement? Do you care about you know your, your, your insurance plans? Of course not. And so we see that, that kind of demographic, you know, the age kind of thing goes in there. But also if you look at education, people are thinking, hey, if I want to target people with a higher education because they're the ones more likely to buy my product because I can tell them the importance of saving, how do I adjust to that? What do I need to do to get them, okay? And the thing is, when you're looking at demographics, you can look at so many different things. You might look at it in terms of gender, male, female, you know, non-binary, all this kind of stuff. You're gonna be looking at it as, how do I tailor towards them? How do I tailor towards them to that demographic, right? And so we see, hey, this is what we need to do here, so we need to do there, and we do that, all right, to kind of get those segments, those demographics. You might look at race, you might look at sexual orientation, you could look at marital status, because there's a lot of different things out there when we're looking at demographics, okay? And as a business, it's your job to kind of track all these things to see, what does this ramification mean? What does it mean when fewer people are getting married, or more people are getting married, or, or for example, in the US, people are waiting longer to get married. What does that mean? Ah, that means it's not their mom and dad paying for the wedding, it's them paying for the wedding themselves. And therefore, what does that mean? Ah, most likely a destination wedding. They might not spend as much, but they might go somewhere to bring their other friends to have a party instead of a celebration. Like when you're 20 something getting married, when you're 40 getting married, it's like, hey, Let's go drink stuff and have a good time. You know, it's, it's a different kind of way you do with things. And so you want to kind of look at that. So I hope this helps you understand a little bit of that macro factor of demographics and how you as a business really have to kind of see how demographics are changing and what do we need to do to adjust to that, to take advantage of it so our business can thrive. Anyway, I wish you all the best. If you want to learn more about those macro factors, we got tons of videos out there, okay? So go back to professorwalters.com and look for this topic and you have a bunch there.
Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here on South Beach in Miami Beach. And today we wanna to talk to you about our generational cohorts. You're not sure what a generational cohort is? Are you a millennial? Are you a Zoomer? Are you a boomer? Yeah, these are generational cohorts. It's kind of like the general characteristics for people born in a certain generation, okay? Now, these aren't fixed for every single person, but there are some general characteristics we can see in them. And so we as marketers can use that to better reach out to them, to better tailor our product offerings to them, to better tailor our communication strategy with them, okay? In this video, I'm just gonna touch on five different generational cohorts and to give you a, just a taste of what they are. I'll be doing videos later that go more into depth into you know Gen Z or Zoomer purchasing habits, but this one, we're just gonna give you kind of a taste of those generations. And so of course, we go with you know age before beauty, and so we're gonna start with the seniors. This is people born before 1946. So if you're born before 1946, you're probably retired by now, right? So you're most likely on a fixed income. What does that mean? What are we gonna be focusing our money on, right? So limited spending power. But what you'll see in seniors is you will see they will be very brand loyal to the things they can still afford. I think of my grandma, she was a, she would be considered a senior kind of one. She, I mean, I knew every time I we went to her house, there would always be Coca-Cola and Wonder Bread and then everything else was generic. Because for her, I gotta have my Coke and I gotta have my Wonder Bread and I can live with the cheap versions of everything else. That brand loyalty was there. Also, seniors tend to buy American more often. So if you said that buy America label, that's gonna influence them better than if you don't. Now, if you look at their shopping habits, you'll notice that they are not as quick to adapt new technology. I mean, how many of you had to explain to grandma or great grandma how to take a picture with their phone or, or what the internet is? I mean, these things do happen and you do need to explain that. So the slower adoption of technology will influence how I'm gonna to advertise to them. Maybe I will advertise to them in the newspaper versus a Facebook post. And if we're looking at their actual purchasing, you'll notice that they will deliberate more on the purchase, comparing prices, seeing what's the best deal. They're gonna be doing that. That's why when you go to the you know 4.30 o'clock buffet, it's full, why? Because it's senior hour and they have, hey, it's a deal to come at this time. They will take advantage of that because they see, look, why would I spend more money when I can get the same stuff for less? They will do that, okay? So you have that in terms of the senior stuff. Now, of course, this sounds very stereotypical, but I'm trying to give you an overall idea of what we're trying to get from these different cohorts to understand them. Now, our next group are baby boomers. This is basically from 1946, you know, right after the World War II when, when daddy came back, daddy came back from the war and babies started happening, right? So usually they go from 1946 to 1964, and the dates I'm giving you, they can go three or four years either way, if you like, okay? Because I know some people are like, but I was born in the late 70s, so I'm not a millennial. Well, it depends who you're talking to. Anyway, with the baby boomers, this was the biggest group of people born in human history. And a lot of them are hitting that retirement age. So you're seeing that they're starting to spend a lot of more money on leisure because look, my kids are growing up. I've got grandkids now, so I'm gonna focus on myself. I'm gonna get that second house. I'm gonna get that sports car. I'm gonna get these things because why not? I'm retired now, I'm relaxing, but I still am close enough to my peak money-making years that I still have a lot of money. I'm not as much on a fixed income. The thing is what you'll see with boomers is they are very individualistic. This is why I always laugh when boomers and zoomers get mad at each other or boomers and millennials get mad at each other. Yeah, they're both in more individualistic, you know, focused demographics, right? So we know if we're gonna make an advertisement for boomers, baby boomers, we need to show them as the center of attention. And the thing is with the boomers, I mean, like we all, we all wanna be young again, right? But boomers, you'll see that, hey, we wanna be young again. So whether it's Botox, contact lenses, you know, all these exercise programs, they're like, hey, whatever I can do to get feel young again, I'm gonna do it. Hello, Viagra. I mean, these are things that, that kind of came because the baby boomers are like, hey, we're seeking leisure. We're, we want to be young. We want to be vivacious and, and, and vi uh, vital to society, but also vital in other places. But I think probably the most important thing we're seeing is the change in baby boomers as they retire and get older. You're starting to see more of a switch to necessity purchases versus desired purchases. So we're starting to see, hey, maybe I do need to buy the long-term care insurance. I need to be paying for that versus another cruise, okay? So just something to kind of think about. Now, baby boomers, after them, you have Gen X. And Gen X is basically from 1965 to 1976, 
Some people say it goes to 1980. It's it's variable, okay, how you want to be. You pick which one you want to be. It's totally fine, all right? Some people say it's, there's the Zennials, which is like late 70s, early 80s, whatever. I'm just gonna say Gen X is about, you know, mid 60s to mid to late 70s, all right? Now, this is the first generation that grew up where both of their parents were working. So how does that change their outlook on the family? How does it change their outlook on, on gender roles? Like, hey, everybody can work. Everybody is working. My mom worked from day one. Heck, my mom was making more money than my dad, you know? Like, hey, that's totally fine. There's no, there's not the, the gender stereotypes you had before. And another thing that really influenced them in terms of trust, you had a first time in history where a lot of parents were getting divorced. So a lot of Gen Xs grew up with divorced parents. And so, of course, that leads to lack of trust. And you'll see that Gen X don't trust advertisements as much. They trust reviews from friends. That's why TripAdvisor with reviews of hotels are so important or Yelp reviews for restaurants. I trust that, not some ad that says this place is tasty food. I wanna know that my friend went there or someone like me went there and they enjoyed it. I trust them more than the corporations because they don't have as much trust in the system, okay? So it's something to kind of think about. Also with Gen X, you see that there's actually, they're marrying later, they're buying homes later than the generation before. And also Gen X is the first generation in a while that is not better off than their previous generation, okay? And so, so you have this kind of, I don't wanna say bitterness, but they seem to be a little bit more timid when it comes to certain issues, okay? So something to kind of think about. Now, after Gen X, you have millennials. And I know there's been a lot of jokes about millennials over the years, but you know, it's it's this next biggest generation that's out there. They have a huge influence and they're really coming into their money-making prime. And millennials, basically you can say come from 1977 to 2000, or maybe 1980 to 2000, depending what you wanna be, uh, how you wanna kind of be in there. But here you have a generation that really is more focused on a really good work-life balance. It's not all about the Benjamins, it's about me enjoying life. I wanna go and hang out on South Beach with my friends. I wanna enjoy that. Yeah, work is important, but my life is important too. So how we sell to them, remember YOLO, you only live once, or FOMO, fear of missing out. These kind of things are more important to this generation than others. Also, this generation is very tech savvy, so you can be reaching out to them at many different platforms, no problem. And I think what's really important is this multitask aspect of millennials. You know, if you're Gen X, you played soccer and that was it. But if a millennial kid, I mean, they had ballet, soccer, and Spanish classes, and that was Monday. Tuesday was tennis, golf, and, and jazz. And, and then Wednesday, they had three other things. They've been multitasking since they were little. That's why as a marketer, you know that they're used to having all this different noise. So I know I do not have just one path to talk to them. I've got to, you know, have an ad on Instagram, an ad on a TikTok. I got to have a product placement in some, you know, popular TV show that they watch online. We start to see these things and to adjust our outreach to them. And another thing you'll see with, with millennials is there's less physical interaction. They would rather text than talk, okay? And so if we're a business, then we need to have those options. Hey, we have our, our, you know, you can chat with somebody online. You can chat with your messages online. We can do that. You can buy, I mean, I can buy plane tickets by text. I don't even have to call anybody. And that's the thing. Millennials, thank you for that. You have helped push us into more of a digital age where we don't have to interact. We can just, like, I can do it on myself. I can do it online. I'll do that. Okay, so something to think about. And also with the millennial generation, you also have more instant gratification becomes more important. We need to have the next day sales. We need to have the instant download. We need to have this now, now, now kind of thing. There's less patience involved. And so we need to make sure is, hey, if we have a long-term service or a long-term product, how do we keep them involved? How do we keep them doing things? And so you have to think about that. You know, hey, how do we show like, look, you're gonna test, you're doing a new weight loss program. Look, it's not gonna be test every you know month. You're gonna be test every week, see the little things, measure every little part of the body so you see some results because you need the instant gratification. So that's the thing you want to think about with millennials. Now, next up, we have Generation Z or iGen or, or I like the new way we call it is Zoomers. You know, the kids that are growing up going to school on computers all the time now because of things that have happened in the world. Basically, Zoomers are from 2001 to about 2015, okay? And here, I mean, these kids, they grew up with the internet already there. It was it didn't come when they were in college, like Gen X didn't. They didn't have it, you know, start to get smartphones when they were like toddlers and teens, with like like millennials. It was already there. I mean, th there's. I mean, I've seen little kids watching YouTube as a baby while their parents are eating dinner. Technology's always been a part of them, so that's not a problem to integrate all the technology. And so we know we need to integrate our outreach to them in all different kinds of technological aspects. 
Now, similar to millennials, it's a very tech savvy generation. It's also very much into multitasking. So you can be reading a book, watching your class online and playing Call of Duty all at the same time because they've been doing that since they were little. Also, they are still very much focused on their self. Though some say that, that Zoomers are more family oriented than millennials were. So a family aspect becomes more important to them. So that could influence your advertising with them and your outreach to them. But I just want to kind of give you guys an overall idea of some of the different generational cohorts that are out there. And believe me, there's so much to think about in terms of purchasing habits for each of these generations that companies need to know, because you're going to have customers that fit into these different characteristics and fit into these gen different generations. And we got to make sure we can appeal to them the best we can. So watch those videos for individual ones, but I just want to give you like an overview. So you have an idea when people talk about boomers or talk about zoomers or whatever, you have an idea when they are. That's why when someone calls uh, Gen X a, a boomer, they're like, okay, boomer. Like the Gen X is like, dude, bro, that's my dad. All right, so heads up. Anyway, I wish y'all the best. I'll say bye from here on South Beach and I hope you learned a little bit about marketing. Remember, hit that subscribe button. We put out marketing videos every week. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here and today we're going to talk about another part of the pest analysis and what we're going to look at now is the international aspects, this international macro influence that could influence your business that you need to deal with. And you might be asking yourself, uh, Mark, why are you doing this in the cornfields of Illinois? Shouldn't it be someplace international and cool and stuff like that? Well, that's the point international things happening can influence your business even here in the cornfields of Illinois. If you think about it, China's had a horrible time. Their pig population has been decimated. So how does that affect us in the corn industry in the U.S.? Well, if we sell cow and pig feed and that cow and pig feed eventually gets sold to China and there's no more pigs, well, that means that demand's going away and we're starting to see, oh, there's an impact effect on us here. We have to think about that. Yeah, it is. You'll be surprised how international things abroad can come and influence our business. And if you think about it, how many of you sang along to Despacito or Humpum Gingham style, right? I mean, those aren't from the US, they're from other places. And you have this influence that comes in. BTS, come on, who doesn't sing along with them, right? I mean, I wish I could dance like, I can't dance like that, but you get the point. I mean, there's so many things that come from from all over that it really can influence it, whether it's fashion, technology, music, food. Hey, how many of you like your sriracha mayo or your sriracha chips or your sriracha sauce? It's not from Illinois, it's from international and these things come in and they can influence. And so what we have to do as businesses is, hey, is this an opportunity for us? Is this a threat for us? What can we do? So you've seen a lot of food places, whether you're going to Subway or getting a Heinz mayo sriracha sauce, they've taken the sriracha that's become popular from abroad and they're instituted in their foods. It's given them a great chance to grow. And the thing is, there's international threats you have to think about as well. It's not all just happy how sriracha has influenced all of our lives and made it tastier. No, there's other things you have to think about because you think about maybe competition coming in from abroad, right? You might not have ever thought about the competition from a Chinese company or a Mexican company or a Canadian company. And now, hey, it's all online. So we're competing against everybody for online prices. What do we do? We have to take that into account. So businesses have to look at that. But the thing is, a lot of times I feel the international influence has been a great thing because it gives you new ideas, just in time inventory management. Yes, thank you very much. Let's get it in, get it out. Less inventory, less space wasted in warehouses. Great, we can find problems sooner. This is awesome. And so the international stuff helps us learn that. And the thing is, is we can borrow these ideas we learn from abroad. I know we've all seen the Big Mac, but if you go to Finland, you'll see a place called Hesburger. It's a, it's a fast food burger joint. And they have the Keros Hamperleinen, or sometimes they call it the Hesburger, with, which looks just like a Big Mac, but it's a thousand times tastier, by the way. But which one came first? Were they influenced by them or vice versa? I mean, I, Big Mac probably came first. And then the Hesburger, the Keros Hamperleinen came, and you're like, huh we could do something like that why don't we oh yeah and so you can see how international some of it will affect you some of it won't i mean what does sriracha have to do with i don't know a bar that doesn't really affect us but it could affect us if we have you know food at our bar then they, people might want sriracha mayo with their cheese curds who knows all right so just something to think about when you're doing the pest analysis so i know it's pest but sometimes it's called pestle and the i is international so this is one of those things here so i want you to know there's some really cool things whether it's music and food but there's other things you have to look at like competition and such so 
I wish y'all the best, and I'll say bye from the growing cornfields of Illinois, which will eventually be turned into feed that will be fed to some animals somewhere around the world. So there you go. Bye. Hey, the fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're talking more about our macroenvironmental factors and how they can affect your businesses in different ways. And today, the macro factor we're going to talk about is the technological factors, the technology changes that happen in society overall that do have an impact on our business. And the thing is, it could be in a direct impact. I mean, think about it: the development of you know four or five, six G technology for phones directly impacts the mobile phone industry. But you know what? That 5G streaming services also affect things like the theater industry. Why? Well, indirectly, do I need to come to a theater and have to listen to 50 people talking while I watch a movie? Or can I throw on some Netflix on my phone? And so we see that there's technological changes will have differing effects, okay? And so it's really important that companies really look and see what technological changes are out there, how could they benefit us, how could they hurt us, or at least you're kind of keeping track of what's going on. Because sometimes firms don't even realize that technology has changed and they get completely wiped out. If you're looking at things like counting, all right? If you think about it, if you were a little kid, you probably had an abacus. You know, the, the it's like a line with the little things. You move over one by one by one to count different stuff. You had that. And the abacus is what we had forever. And then they invented the slide rule. And what a slide rule is, if you wanted to know what 12 times 12 is, you'd move it 12 and over on the 12 line, and 12 times 12 is 144, and you would do that. And then technology changed, and the calculator came out, right? And so then we had our you know little digital calculators, 12 times 12 is 444 and we were great. And the thing is, each one of those technological changes really kind of wiped out the previous industry, right? The abacus industry didn't do so well once we had the slide rule and the slide rule got wiped out by the calculator. But now, what technological change has wiped out the calculator? It's not like they came out with a new version of the calculator. What they came up with was new software. Look on your phone. Your phone has a calculator right there. The whole industry got wiped out. What about the watch industry? Oh wait, I don't have a watch, but I always know what time it is because I use my phone. And so we start to see is, though some technological changes aren't necessarily directly our competitors, they might have a major impact for us in a positive way or in a negative way, okay? So if we look at how technology is used, for example, I'm a professor, hence Professor Walters. And I do teach face to face and, and I go there and I'm in front of my class of a few hundred students talking away and blah, 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 and all kinds of stuff. I have that. But the thing is technology is not necessarily stealing my job, but I can use it to help my students out, right? I can put videos like this online because maybe they fell asleep in class. It's an 8 a.m. class. I don't, I don't fault them for falling asleep, okay? Or maybe they're at a job interview and they can't be at class that day. I don't want them to miss out on that content, but having these online videos gives me a chance to give this information, the education I have to my students when they can't be face to face. So it's helped improve my teaching. I remember when I was a student, when we would take notes, you had to write every word down, right? Now you can get a book that has all the slides in it, or maybe they're online. There's all kinds of things you can have to actually help you learn better. It doesn't change the content that I'm teaching. It just makes it easier for people to learn. So you'll see these things actually influencing business, okay? Other things you can look at is how technology has changed in terms of you look at political campaigns, how they raise money. Instead of having to go to the big wigs to ask for millions of dollars and stuff like this, you can get small donations online. There's all kinds of little bit of technological change. If you can see those changes take advantage of it, it can really help you out. So the thing is, is sometimes you do get big impact like the Washington theater behind me, the technological changes of, hey, we can project movies on much bigger screens now, we can put them in, in a whole amphitheaters just for movie theaters, really changed how these small theaters in America, in small towns, kind of died off. They couldn't compete with the new competition that used that new technology to have those big screens and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different things you have to think about in terms of those macro changes. And the thing is, you can think of all kinds of different things. Think about how te technological change in in medicine would change things hey we found a cure for cancer well how does that affect our business well in terms of our employees I mean do we have 
employees that might die of cancer, now they're not going to die. Our customers, they're not going to die from cancer, so that helps out. But how could that influence our business? You know, healthcare is big business, right? So all of a sudden we have a cure for cancer. Well, what do we do with all those oncologists that now that there's no cancer anymore? I mean, these are things you kind of think about. Like, let's hope one day that is something we have to consider. We do find a cure for cancer, but it's just kind of one of those things you got to think about because technological changes, I mean, all the things with the internet, think about how that influenced how changed shopping overall and retail shopping and research and booking your vacations and stuff like that from I need to go to a travel agent to now you can do it all on your own. I mean, you could go do a lot of research on waltersworld.com right now about different destinations. So you have things like that. So. I just want to talk about that technological kind of macro factor to give you some ideas because it does play a big impact and you got to be making sure you're paying attention because you never know when a technological change can totally revolutionize your business. All right. So I wish you all the best and I'll say bye from here in Quincy, Illinois. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to talk about is Porter's Five Forces Analysis. It's kind of an older model, but it's a very powerful strategic analysis model that you can use to better understand an industry that you're going to be working in. Whether you're thinking of the general hotel industry or the public university industry, like we're here at the University of Illinois, or maybe you're thinking something very niche, like we are in the uber caffeinated drink industry. There's a lot of things you really have to think about, and this model really gives you a really robust idea of what's going on, and it focuses on five different competitive factors. One is what we call the threat of new entrants. How likely is it that a new competitor is going to come into a market? Another thing you're going to look at is what is the bargaining power of our suppliers? Do I have to sit there and say whatever you want supplier or can I dictate things to them? Then we have to think about the threat of substitute products. How likely is it that our customers are going to switch to something different? Not our competitors, but something completely different. Like, does Ford worry that people are going to switch to taking the bus and things like that? And then we look at the bargaining power of our buyers, our customers, how much power they have over us, right? And then we look at intensity of rivalry. How much do we have to worry about our competition in that industry? And the thing is, you really have to figure out is what is that key industry you're going to be looking at? Because it can be very, very different depending on your focus. For example, am I just a YouTube channel? What makes a good YouTube channel? Let's think about all those things. But if I focus down, what makes a good YouTube channel that's for education in marketing? You're going to have some different things you're really going to focus on, right? So it's really important to look at the overall industry you're looking at before you start this model, okay? Now, the first threat I want to talk about is the threat of new entrants. So how likely is it that a new competitor is going to come into a market? Is it high, like really likely it's going to happen? Or is it low, very few, very little chance there's actually going to be new competition? And there's a lot of things that are going to influence your rating on this. One thing you might look at is brand identity. Is this an industry where the brands are already set? I mean, there's no point in going into the cola industry because you're either Coke or you're Pepsi. So the threat of entry in the cola industry is very low. But the thing is, sometimes you have different kinds of entry barriers or lack of entry barriers. So for example, there could be government policies that influence the likelihood of new competition. If you ask all your friends, where do you pay your bill or your water bill to? I'm going to guarantee pretty much everyone pays the same company for their water bill because most cities and towns have one company that delivers their water. So there's a monopoly for that. So that company that has the monopoly with the city for water, they're not worried about competition. So that's going to keep that threat kind of low. Other things that might keep people out is capital requirements. Like if it's going to cost me a lot of money just to get started, it's more likely that people are not going to move in. That's why you see a lot of little boutique stores because look, anybody can sew a shirt together. Anybody can design stuff. If you got some cool skills, you can be a success. Start an Etsy store, have a little pop-up shop. Not really too much required capital to get started. So it's a lot more likely that there's going to be competition. Now, if you have to spend $3 billion to build a factory, that's going to lower that chance. Okay. So you might look at things like economies of scale or switching costs going from one product to another. These kind of things will influence that threat of new entrants. Now, the second thing we want to look at is the bargaining power of suppliers. How likely it is that they're going to be able to push their agenda onto me or I can influence them. And a lot of it comes down to the differentiation of inputs. So if you're 
supplier is giving you something that's way better than the other suppliers, they're gonna have more power over you. But if it's something like sugar, where you have so many different companies that kind of produce the exact same sugar, they're not gonna have very much power over you, okay? So you'd have, oh, low bargaining power in the sugar industry, but maybe high power in terms of the chips that go into computers, right? We all want Intel inside. Well, Intel has a lot of bargaining power because people want that Intel inside. That's why you notice when your computer breaks, it's not the Intel chip, it's something else because they know, look, the Intel chip's the most important part, not the screen, not the motherboard, those things, no. Now, another thing that influences bargaining power, you look, might look at the concentration of suppliers, lots of suppliers, there's probably, they don't have too much power. If there's very few suppliers, there's the other things we have to look at and think about because we only have a few people we could work with. Also, to those supplier, how important are our volumes to them? Because think about it, Walmart can pretty much dictate whatever they want to their suppliers because they're so big, right? And so if we're like, Walmart is 90% of my business, I'm gonna do anything they want. Well, yeah, of course. So the suppliers to Walmart have very little power, very little bargaining power. So that would be a low bargaining power situation. Now, another thing that's gonna influence this supplier bargaining power is, I know I talked about the differentiation inputs, but how those inputs really affect the overall cost of a product is if one of those supplier inputs is you know 80% of the cost of the product, that's gonna have a lot more impact on you than something else, all right? And another one that kind of scares people is when you think of the threat of forward integration okay or vertical integration from a supplier to become your competition like i don't want my supplier to be my competitor i want to keep them happy so there's a more of a chance that they could become my competitor i'm gonna do whatever i can to keep them happy so they just stay being a supplier instead of being a competitor and you want a good example when that went badly go back to the first playstation read up on nintendo and sony and that whole debacle there and how sony really kind of created their worst competition the playstation because they didn't really think about the supplier power that Sony could come down and become a competitor. Now, the next thing we look at is what we call substitute power or threat of substitute products. So basically, how much of a threat is it that our customers will switch to a substitute type of product, okay? And this really will depend on what industry you're looking at. So if I'm thinking of the restaurant industry, well, a substitute would be eating at home, maybe, maybe ordering out, I guess, versus eating in a restaurant. It could be that way. Or you could look at it in terms of education. Is it, do they get, do they get a, a four-year degree or do they substitute and get a, a two-year degree? Or do they get, you go to vocational school or they just learn online? I mean, there's other substitutes out there. What you wanna think about is what's the buyer's propensity to actually switch? Okay, that's one thing is car companies aren't too worried about the train industry or the bus industry in the US because they know if people have a car, they're gonna drive their car to work. They're not gonna take the bus, they're not gonna take the train because man, it's so much easier for me to get to work. So when I drive to work, it takes me 10 minutes. If I take the bus to get to work, it's an hour. I'm not gonna switch. That's too much time wasted. And so we have to think about these things. So that's gonna be something you look at. Now the fourth factor we're gonna look at is buyer power. Do they have high buyer power or do they have low buyer power? Like do our customers dictate to us or can we dictate to them? So it's kind of like the flip side of that bargaining power of suppliers, okay? And so obviously if we're looking at volume of purchase, our bigger customers are gonna have better say. That's why when you go to a restaurant, you're like, why are they being so nice to those people? Why are they going to their table all the time? Because they come to that restaurant more often, they're, they're regulars, they spend a lot more money, so they're gonna be more important, so they're gonna have more influence, right? You're only going once, people don't care. That's why when you look at it in terms of tourist spots, right? You go to Venice in Italy or Orlando in Florida, you'll notice that the restaurants don't care about the customer really because they're like, look, we have so many customers and you're only gonna come here once and you're gonna leave from your going back home that you have no power over me. The next client will come through. And so you have to think about these things. Another thing you might wanna look at is product differences. So if our product is very different than our competitors, I'm not really too worried about the power of my buyers. So they're like, look, if I'm selling a Ferrari, I'm not too worried about a Ford or, or, or a Mercury, all right? I'm just like, we're, we're not competing. There's too big of a difference here. So there's not gonna to be too much po uh, buyer power in that situation. But I think the biggest influence in buyer power is what we call buyer information. The more information that buyers have about the prices, about the market, about their options, the more power they have over you because that information is power. I mean, think about it. If you see something online that offers to sell a, a book for $5 and then you go to the bookstore and it's $10, 
Why are you going to pay $10 at the bookstore? Of course not. You're going to buy it online because you saw that cheaper price online. It's giving you that information. And so as the more information is out there, the more power flows to the buyers because they can say, well, if I go online, it's only five bucks. That's why you're seeing companies like Best Buy and stuff like that. They say, we'll price match. Show us the price, we'll match it because you can go out there and find that lowest price. Now, one thing though that will take away the buyer power is brand identity. If you identify with a brand, look, I'm a Coke person. Person. I like my Coke, I like my Culver's, I like my Delta. I buy with them and they know that and they know that I'm going to pay more money to have my Coke, to have my Culver's, to fly with Delta because I like them better. I'm loyal to them. And if the buyer has loyalty to your brand, well, they're, when they give you that loyalty, they're also giving you that power because they know that, hey, they're going to want to spend more money to have our product. So, we have, they, so the company has power over you. So you kind of think about these things that way. Also, remember that, that Nintendo PlayStation example I talked about before? You have the same thing. If there's a chance that your customer could backwards integrate and become your competitor, yeah, that, that's when you're gonna be kind of worried. You're gonna make sure you keep them happy so your customer does become a competitor. And then the fifth factor you wanna look at is intensity of rivalry. So how much do they fight in this industry? And it really depends on what industry you're looking at, right? So we're thinking about these things. And so one of the things that will influence the intensity of rivalry is the overall industry growth. Think about it, if there's plenty of room to grow, we're fine, we're happy. But as the industry growth shrinks, that means the market shrinks, and there's less and less space, you're gonna have much more intensity of rivalry, much more fights out there. And you might know that, and I, I love doing this example in my class where I go up to a student, and I say, hey, who, who, who's ever shared a room with a brother or sister? You're like, yeah, now that you're in college, you share a room with them anymore? No, do you like them better now? Yes because we're not together all the time. And so you think about that. When I have space, my brother and I have different rooms. It was great. When we lived in one house, we had a share room. We fought every day. It's that lack of space. We got room to grow. We're okay. Very room to grow. You have much more rivalry there. Another thing you're going to look at is actually the sunk cost or, or switching cost. Because look, if we know that people are going to buy our product and get stuck with us, we're gonna have a lot more rival to get people to buy in. So that's why you'll see so much competition when the new gaming system comes out, whether it's a new Nintendo or Xbox or, or, or PlayStation, they're fighting to get people to lock in. That's why you have so many exclusive titles at launch, because you don't want them to like, oh, well, I can play FIFA on any of these systems. So which one does it matter? No, we need to have exclusive Halo or exclusive Mario or Crash Bandicoot or whatever that's only on this one system so we can lock people in. So if we can lock people in, the rivalry is going to be a lot higher. If it's free for anybody to do it, then the rivalry is going to be a lot less. Another thing you look at is also if there's not a lot of differences between the brands, you're actually going to have more rivalry because all the sugar companies are fighting with each other over price because there's not much of a difference. But when it's you know a Ferrari versus a Ford, yeah, there, there's not much intense sort of rivalry there because we're doing such a different product that yeah, we're, we're not fighting over the same stuff. So I hope this kind of rough overview of Portis Five Forces can help you better understand how you can analyze the industry so you have a better idea of what's going on. Because this is one thing I tell my students to do whenever they work with a company. It may be an old school model, but it gives you so much information to understand the suppliers and the rivalry you know, with the competitors and the buyers and the substitutes and just the industry overall when people are coming in. That really gives you a much better chance of becoming an expert in an industry if you have these as your basics. Okay, so I hope this helped you know a little bit more about the five forces analysis and I wish you all the best. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here and today we're here in Freiburg, Germany at the train station. And today we want to talk about our competitive strategies that you might see businesses use out in the world today, okay? Now there's two overall competitive strategies that I want to talk about. One is called a differentiation strategy, and the other one is a cost leadership strategy. And I'm gonna give you an example of the trains here in Germany to explain those differences, okay? Now, if you have what's called a differentiation strategy, you're making your product different. You're making it special. So people are willing to spend more money to buy it. I mean, think about it. If you're here in Germany, you get that Mercedes, it's got the leather seats and the nice sound system and stuff like that. So you're willing to pay more money for it versus a Volkswagen, which has usually not as cool of a stereo, not as cool of a design, things like that, right? And so by by being different, being special, you're driving people to want to buy more of your stuff. Also, you do this in order to kind of create loyal customers because they know, hey, if I get a Mercedes, it's going to be really cool because they're always really cool. So you have that kind of mentality 
when you're looking at this differentiation strategy. If you're looking at retail, this is kind of the strategy that a Target would do in the US where they have really nice stores, you know, that everyone's in the nice uniforms and the nice layouts and the nice products, and the displays and stuff like that. Therefore, with all those extra costs, it means you're gonna have to raise your prices anyway, but people kind of expect that because it's different, it's special. And the thing is, is the more you differentiate your products, the more likely it is that you can beat some competition in some area. Maybe it's in comfort, maybe it's in speed, maybe it's in other things. For example, here in Germany, there's multiple types of trains. And if you take the ICE, okay, the Inner City Express, those you pay a lot more money for. Why? They're cleaner, they're, they've got comfier seats, they go like 100 kilometers an hour faster than the other trains. So you're gonna get there a lot faster, a lot, a lot more comfort, and people are willing to pay the extra for that. So they have a differentiation strategy. Now the thing is, not everyone can be special and different, and not everyone can afford that kind of stuff. So what some companies do is what's called a cost leadership strategy. This is where you're gonna be doing things cheaper in order to pass on that cheapness, those savings, onto your end customer. So here in Germany, Aldi is famous for its cheap prices. But you know, when you go into Aldi, you know, you're gonna to have to put your coin in for the wagon. You might have to bring your own bags. You're gonna not have a ton of selection of all kinds of stuff, but it'll get you the basics at a super low price. And there's people that really value that. And so places like Aldi or Walmart really focus on that cost leadership. And the thing is doing this cost leadership is not just about having low prices, it goes throughout your business. You have to think about it. What's our supply chain management gonna to be to help us lower prices or lower costs in general? What about our, our employment? Like how do we hire people? Think about it. When you go to Walmart, aren't you always upset because there's never anybody at any of the lines to check you out? Exactly, they have fewer people there. Target, the line's a lot faster because they're paying more to give that different level of service to make it more special. And the thing is you can have cheap stuff and you can have expensive stuff and that's okay. And sometimes what you'll see is what we call a third kind of competitive strategy and that's a focus strategy. That is when you focus just on one specific group and you can have focus differentiation or you can have focus cost leadership. So a focus differentiation strategy would be kind of a, a, a high-end women's shoe company that only sells the fanciest kinds of shoes. So they're focusing just on shoes, just for women, so it's focused down, 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 but they're selling the really fancy ones, so it's being differentiated. Or you might see one that focuses on, they only sell cheap kids' clothes, right? So it's cheap for cost leadership, kids' clothes only, so it's focused down. So you'll see those things out there. And there's a lot of different stuff you can see out there. I know an old version of this video, I remember my, my oldest son had a Cookie Monster shoe. Okay, and the thing is, is if you get kids shoes, you don't you don't buy kids clothes very expensive because they grow out of them. And the thing is, if you buy just a little tennis shoe for them, it's like five or six bucks. But if it gets a Cookie Monster label on there, oh, now it's like 20 bucks to get that because it's different, it's special than your kids want to wear that Cookie Monster shoe versus not wearing shoes at all, okay? So you have these kind of ideas. And the thing is, companies in general will usually choose one or the other. We're either gonna do cost, cost leadership or we're gonna do differentiation because people kind of focus that way. You either go to Target or you go to Walmart. You go to Kaufhof or you go to you know Aldi. You have these, these this split. Because what happens is if you don't pick and you kind of get in the middle, that's where you can have problems. In the US, you think of Sears and Kmart, you know, they, they've had a lot of trouble. A lot of most have gone out of business because they're not as fancy as like a Target, but they're not as cheap as a Walmart. So if I want to save money, I'm going to go to Walmart instead. If I want something special, I'll, I'll go to the Target instead of this. So that's where you have some issues. And the thing is, is the trains here, you have the fancy trains, the ICs for differentiation. But for those of us that have a group of people and we're not going that far and time isn't that important to us, we can take the regional express trains, which are significantly slower and they stop at a lot more stops and it takes a lot more time. But I can get five of us to travel around for 50 euros versus one of us to have to pay 100 euros. I'm like, wow, 500 euros or 50 euros? You know what? I'm willing to sacrifice an hour of train time to save that kind of money. All right. So I hope this helps you know the difference between differentiation strategies and cost leadership strategies and the idea of that focus strategy as well. Anyway, if you want to learn more, hit that subscribe button. We got all kinds of business videos to help people out. And I'll say choose from here in Freiburg, Germany. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're at the Great Rift Valley in Tanzania. And today we're gonna to talk about our industry key success factors. These are kind of the, the core capabilities, the product attributes, the competencies, the important stuff in an industry 
that will have the greatest impact on our long-term success. These are the things that we need to strategically focus on in order to be better than the rest of the players in our industry. And the thing is, usually what you'll see is every industry will have five or six really key success factors, like things we have to make sure we're doing, right? So if you're looking at the soda industry, right? You want to have your Cokes. Well, one of them is a wide variety of products. I mean, think about it. Coke has Coke, Sprite, Fanta. They've got juices. They've got waters, things like that. Look at Pepsi. They have a wide variety of products too. Pepsi, Mountain Dew, Pepsi Max, stuff like that, right? And so we have this wide variety. Another thing that's important in the soda industry is marketing. I mean, everywhere you go, you'll see Coke and you'll see Pepsi and you'll see these things. Distribution networks is very important because we've got to make sure people get that Coke whenever they want it, whether it's at a vending machine at your school or here in a lodge in the middle of Tanzania. I got to make sure people can get that ice cold Coca-Cola. And these are kind of some of the factors that we look at and say, hey, this is really important in the soda pop industry, okay? But the thing is, in these five or six key success factors, every company that's that really wants to succeed or at least survive has to be at least acceptable in each of these things. If they're really bad at one of them, people might not buy it at all. I mean, it doesn't matter if you have distribution and marketing. If your soda tastes like garbage, no one's going to drink it, right? So you have that. So you have to think about these things. But the thing is, to be excellent in all five or six of these key success factors, it costs a lot of money. So what happens is companies usually focus on one or two of them to really like push themselves through. I mean, some do more, but in general, we just kind of focus on certain stuff. And the thing is, key success factors may change over time. So we've got to be looking at today, but also in the future. If you think about the car industry, 20, 30 years ago, safety was really important, right? It was one of the key success factors, having a safe car, because they sell cars that weren't very safe, right? And so a, a car company like Volvo, they saw that safety is really important, and we just focused on that. Now, their design, it wasn't sexy, but you know what? It was safe, and that's what they focused on. But now, we see how the industry has changed. We see that in the car industry, we've regulated in airbags and seat belts and crumple zones, and so all of a sudden, that safety key success factor has kind of gone because all the cars are pretty much safe. So you have to think about those things. Now, when you're thinking of industry key success factors, make sure you realize what industry are you actually talking about? Because the thing is, I'm here in Tanzania, right? So all the different industries that this Tanzania trip could be in for tourism, it could be the overall tourism industry. It could be on a tour industry, right? It could be on an African tour industry. It could be on a safari tour industry. And so what happens is you can have a broad kind of industry and then you could focus down on different niches. And what you can do is if you focus down on that special niche that you want to be good in, hey, let's make sure we're doing really good in these things because that's what's really going to get our niche for the Tanzania tour business. But overall, they still need to kind of consider the overall travel industry. Like, yeah, we need to make sure we have the tourists stay at places that have views like this. Yeah, like those kind of things will really pay off. So you got to kind of think about those things. And when you're starting to develop these key success factors, remember, it's the industry overall. It's not just one company because one company, they have their core competencies, but the industry overall, we got to think about these things. And we do that so we can kind of think of where should we focus our strategic vision? What should we be working on? And if we see that we're kind of lacking in one of these key success factors, we need to focus on some strategy to improve that. Okay. Now, when you're going to be making these key success factors, you need to ask yourself three questions. One, what do customers want? Okay. So what do the customers really want from the product? What are they going to deliver? Who's the real customer? These kind of things. Second thing, how do we compete? How is competition in that market? Are they, they fighting tooth and nail? Are they getting along? What's it like? Is it, do we have to go produce in different countries? What do we have to do? And the third thing that we call our death bells. Is there any kind of product attribute that would make people never want to buy that product again? For example, if there's rats in the restaurant, it doesn't matter how good the food is, you're going to go out of business, okay? And so if we focus on each one of those individual questions, the first one, what do customers want? So what we're doing is we're kind of looking at the basic rationale of why people are buying the product. Is it to communicate? Is it to be, you know, fill their thirst? What is it for? So in soda, what are people looking for? Oh, I'm looking for a flavor I like, right? Flavor is important. And I want to make sure it's where I can buy it. It's got to be close by. And, and I'm only going to buy stuff I've heard of. I mean, have you ever gone to a party and somebody brought a soda you never heard of? You're like, mm, 
I'm going to go with that Coke because you know what it is, right? So you have these things. And what's important when you're looking at what customers want, make sure you realize there could be different customers. So for example, my kids play the Switch, but I bought the Switch, right? So the thing is they have to look at the people that's using it, the people that are buying it, the influencers that are out there. All these kind of things will influence what customers want. And we'll also look at is how do customers choose between different products, okay? So you have that. Now, the next thing, remember, we look at the competition side side of things. So this could be looking at like, how do we compete? Do we fight over endorsements? Is it about distribution networks? Is it about advertising? Is it about new product development? There's all kinds of different things we could be fighting over. So going back to the soda industry, right? They're, they're fighting over, you know, shelf space, right? Who's going to get the best shelf space? Who's going to have the vending machine outside the stores? Who's going to have the vending machine inside the schools or the buildings? They're fighting over these things. They're advertising who gets to have the spot on the big game, right? You know, so we're doing all these things out there and we're fighting over different stuff. So that's why you'll also see sometimes we'll look at production. If you look at clothing, you look to survive in the clothing industry, low cost production is important. That's why you'll see a lot of clothes are made in China and Thailand where you have low cost labor so you can make it cheaper. Whereas in beer, well, one of the issues we have in beer and soda, it's really heavy, but we don't make a lot of money on it. So we need to have local distribution. That's why if you're your Coke, you see your Coke delivery person, he or she is probably not that far from your house making those deliveries. Same thing with the beer guy, okay? So you gotta think about these things. And then we look at those death bells. And those death bells we kind of look at, you know, it's it's what is there anything that would get people never to buy your product again? Something that would turn them off, things that really are not something you want to have. Like I said, the rats in the restaurant, soda that doesn't taste good, a vacation destination that's not safe. I mean, I felt totally safe here in Tanzania. This place is awesome, the people are great, it's a fun time. And so what you do is you take all these things and you kind of rank them. Okay, so what customers wants, how important are things, and competition, what's really most important, and are there any death bells we need to be careful of? And you start to see some relationships. So if we think about it, for soda, right, soda, hey, I only buy stuff I know, so marketing and branding is important. Um, competition, hey, we fight over who can have the best TV commercials, right? And then death bell, hey, you know, if no, people never heard of your soda, they're not going to buy it. So, okay, marketing is going to be one of the key success factors. Another thing is in soda, I like, you know, I like my Coke. My kids like, you know, Sprite. Hey, we need to have the variety. But also, how are, how are they competing? Who's coming up with new flavors, right? And a death bell, if you don't have a flavor I like. So, wide variety of products come in there. Then there's other things. You might look at, hey, I want to make sure I can get up my soda. But the distribution side of it is going to be another thing. Because if, if I can't buy the soda, hey, I, I can't buy it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin it. So distribution would be another key success factor for the soda industry. And the thing is, these five or six key success factors or industry key success factors, they can be different for different people. It depends how you look at the industry, okay? So what I kind of find, like when I grade exams that, that work on this, or I talk to clients about these things, I say, look, there's, you know, there's some that are definite, but when you get to the fifth or sixth one, it could really depend on what you're focusing on, what's more important to you. So do want to check those things out. So I hope this helps you know a bit more about key success factors, and I hope you did enjoy the view here in Tanzania. If you want to know more specific key success factors, I actually have another video that goes through like technology key success factors, manufacturing key success factors, general marketing key success factors. So if you're working on a project or you're trying to figure out where you should be focusing your business on, that can help you out too. Anyway, I want to head off and go see some lions and some water buffalo and some cool stuff here in Tanzania. You have a great time studying for your exam or good luck improving your business and figure out those key success factors. We wish you all the best. And I'll say bye from here in Tanzania. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in the Netherlands. And today we're gonna to talk about are some of the common industry key success factors that you might find in different industries. Now we have another video that talks about how you actually develop these key success factors. And this video is focused on some common ones you actually do see. So if we start looking at areas like in technology, for example, if they have expertise in a particular technology, that's gonna be a lot more helpful for them in order to be successful. So in the pharmaceutical industry, you see that they're trying to get the, the newest technology. They're trying to get the, the best researchers and stuff like that because they know, hey, in tech, we gotta have the best stuff in order to make the best new drugs, the best new technologies, the best new gaming systems and stuff like that. Another key success factor you might see in technology industries is a kind of a proven 
track record in improving the production process. Basically, they're good at innovating. Like, we always get excited for the new iPhones and stuff like that because Apple always seems to come out with new cool gadgets. So I want to be the one to get that new first new iPhone or new first iPad or whatever because it's kind of a cool thing. And so we kind of look at that as another kind of key success factor you might see. And sometimes those are actually focused in the production process. So if you think back, Toyota with their just-in-time inventory system, that really Really did give them a really great advantage over their competition because they invented a new production process that actually eliminated a lot of waste which is really cool and helped them kind of stay ahead of the crowd because remember when you're looking at key success factors there's usually you know five or six in an industry but we need to focus just on one or two because it gets too expensive and so Toyota really focused on that process innovation kind of stuff that really helped them kind of take off in the 80s and 90s and the thing is sometimes in manufacturing industries you might see that the ability to have scale economies or getting those learning curve effects. Remember your Econ 101, 102 class? Yes, those things really do take effect because it's really hard for me to go into the car industry because, man, it's hard to compete against Ford or Toyota and all these kind of things because they've been doing it for so many years. They've scaled their economies out. They've, they, they've learned so much how to do things. I have to make all those mistakes first and therefore I can't really compete against them because they already know all the good stuff. And that helps them to have low production costs, which as a new firm, you won't have because you'll have very high new production costs. So, hey, there's an issue right there. Now, if you're looking at an industry where product liability is something that customers really insist upon having good quality control know-how that will go a long way to help your business be a success because people know is oh that's the good one that's the one that doesn't break down remember the old saying you never get fired for buying IBM this is the kind of thing we're looking at now if you're in a really kind of capital intense industry like the steel industry having high utilization of fixed assets that's going to be really important for a key success factor in that industry because hey look to have these forges and to have all this steel manufacturing stuff costs a lot of money to have all those assets and we got to make sure we're using all of it when we can and utilizing every little bit of it in order to help us succeed now Going along with that, if we're looking at in terms of labor, in terms of manufacturing, well, access to skilled labor is going to be important or access to cheap labor. That also could be a key six fast factor, depending where you're going to go. So clothing manufacturing, it's about the cheap labor, right? We need to have that because it's very, very manual intense, but we don't make a lot of money off a t-shirt. Whereas if it's more of a skilled labor thing, we're going to want more access to skilled labor. So that's going to have an effect. And then another one for manufacturing is if your company can do low cost design and maintenance that's going to have a big effect on you because hey if we can make it cheaper it's going to make it easier for us also if we can make it simpler less parts mean less things that can break so that could be something else that could be a key success factor now if we're looking more in the distribution kind of things you might want to look at a key success factor in a company like a coca-cola or a soft drink industry or fast moving consumer goods where distribution is a key thing a strong network of wholesalers and distributors is going to be vital for your success in your industry because if you can't get those coke out to every place people want to buy it they're gonna buy Pepsi instead so it becomes really really important to have that network and what goes along with that is having a really strong kind of direct sales capabilities like you can talk directly to the end customers or you can tell talk directly to those retailers and have a good like information sharing with them that's why having a good website and things like that really is a key for distribution because maybe they can't go to my store but they can go on their phone and buy and so that's why it's going to be really important that's why Amazon does so well because their website is so easy to use it makes it easy to kind of distribute the sales side of things because you just go online, it's right there. And then of course, if you're looking at distribution, you gotta be where the customers are. And one of the things are, have you ever had it where that Snickers bar is just staring at you when you're at the checkout line going, Mark, eat me, eat me. Yeah, that, that product placement, that's another thing we gotta look at. That's also another key success factor, especially if you're looking at you know candy industry and stuff like that. Hey, we need to be right there because no one's really going to the store to buy candy. They get talked into buying candy because they're staring at it as it says, eat me eat me and these kind of things now if you're looking at kind of general marketing key success factors one thing you might want to look at is the key thing is maybe a wide variety of products so for example in the soda industry one of the key success factors is having this wide variety you've got your cola right you've got your diet cola you've got your clear soda like sprite right or seven up and then you've got your orange soda like fanta or crush or something like that you have all these different things because you know we can't be a success in this industry if we only have one soda we need to have a variety of them. 
Also with marketing related key success factors, it helps if people know your name. A strong brand and a strong brand name is vital for success here because people need to know, oh, that's what I'm buying. I know that can of Coke. I mean, I'm here in the, in the Netherlands. You know, I know what Coke is, so I'll buy that. I don't know what Chocomel is. I'm not going to try that. Is it chocolate? Is it honey? Is it just something brown? I don't know what it is. Ah, but I know what Coke is. I know that brand. And so that's going to help you be more successful. Now, of course, your sales personnel are going to be very important in your terms your success when it comes to marketing whether it's you know helpful service personnel or highly trained service personnel that can get things done quicker that's going to help you be more success i mean think about it don't you like going to restaurants where they're faster and efficient and kind and helpful and, and know their stuff yes that's going to help you as well and also it's really key that you're also fulfilling the orders accurately okay are you actually sending what you were supposed to send out for example i got a new camera not the camera I'm using right now, but I got another camera. I'm not using it because when they filled out my order, they didn't put a battery in the camera. So I'm kind of SOL right now using my old camera. And two other things I'd say that kind of relate to marketing is if you have good warranties and good guarantees that you stand behind, because then people feel better. Well, if anything does go wrong, at least they're going to take care of me. And of course, clever advertising. I mean, how many of you have seen an ad and, go, and had a chuckle? And go, you know what? Maybe I will try that product out. These kind of things. Now, if we move towards more like skill skills and capabilities in terms of key success factors, you might look at a talented workforce. I mean, if I want to have the best accounting services in the country, I need to hire the best accounting students, right? So I'll go make sure I'm hiring them. If I want to have the best basketball team, I got to make sure I'm going out and getting the best basketball players, right? So my, my management team is going to be important. My, my HR team, my, my, my team development kind of people, they're all going to be important in order for us to keep being a success. And with those people, you might be looking at design expertise. I mean, think about it. If you you're a design house or a clothing house, you need the best designers, right? They come up with cool ideas and cool new products and, and shirts and outfits. Yeah, if you can have that better designer that designs better stuff, it's more likely you're gonna be a success. And then there's some general key success factors that pop up in a lot of different industries. One, if you can be the overall cost leader, that is gonna help you out. There's a reason why Walmart and Aldi are successful all around the world, because they have found a way to keep costs down. Another one you might wanna look at, especially in retail, convenient location. I mean, if you're where people are gonna be, that makes life a lot easier. I mean, back in the day, being in the mall was a key success factor because you had the foot traffic. Nowadays, convenient location, the mall isn't convenient anymore. You'll see those Walgreens and CVSs and those corner pharmacies, they're going wherever people are are living and they're taking that one main intersection and they're building there because that's the convenient location. That's why you'll pay more money for getting milk at Walgreens because it's right there versus driving 30, 40 minutes to go to the big box store, the big grocery store. And of course, you also have to look at a balance sheet. If the company is run well and they have a strong balance sheet where the money is in the bank, that's always a thing that can be successful, especially if you're having a kind of a very cyclical industry like steel or housing or something like that because you have the boom times and the bust times and just to survive those bust times we got to have a good balance sheet to get by now there's a ton of other basic key success factors out there i just wanted to give you some basic ones you might see to give you some ideas to kind of think about in your industry so if you want to remember if you want to learn how to actually make these key success factors go check out our other video that talks about how to develop key success factors it's actually from here in the netherlands as well so i'll talk to you later bye from the netherlands Hi guys, Mark here with Walters World, and today we're going to talk about the GE McKinsey Matrix, sometimes just called the GE Matrix. It's a matrix that businesses use when they try to decide where should we invest our money? What are the business units we should be putting most of our energies in? Where do we put our best people? Where do we put our money? And also, which divisions do we say goodbye to? Okay, so what you do is you divide, you have two criteria. One is industry attractiveness. Okay, so how well does this industry look? Is it, gonna, is it growing? Is it slow? Is it bad? Is it good? What is it? The other one is the strength of your business unit. And you have to be honest about your business units because you can have multiple business units in your company and you have to compare each of them. Hey, how does this work for these guys? All right, so when we look at market attractiveness, you're looking at market growth rate, you're looking at market size, you're looking at the profitability of that, of that industry 
rivalry in the industry. You're looking at the global prospects of that industry. There's all kinds of things that influence it to make an industry look good or bad in terms of how we want, how attractive it is. Okay, so basically, the ones we can make the most money in, we have the most potential in, not us, but in general, those industries, those are the ones that have a higher potential, we look at those. Okay, so if we look at the strength of our business unit, you're looking at a few things. One, you're looking at brand equity. How strong is the brand for that business unit? Okay. Another thing you look at is the market share that that business unit has. Is it big? Is it weak? What is it? You're going to look at that. Another thing you're going to look at is the basic business strategy. How strong has your business strategy been? Does that business unit do a good job or a bad job? Another thing you're going to look at is basically the distribution channels that are out there and do you have access to them? Because if you don't, it doesn't matter how strong you are if you can't get it to the customer. Also, you look at production capacity that that business unit does have. And then you look at the profit margin that that business unit has in relation to its competitors. Okay, so we come up with these strategies, we have our scores and all these kind of things. And basically we have three strategies we have. One, we're gonna grow the business. Two, we're gonna hold our position. Or three, we're gonna harvest it. We're gonna get rid of that business unit. And you have to do these things. You don't keep selling slide rules when no one uses them anymore, okay? So when are we going to grow the business? Well, one, obviously, if it's a high growth industry and we're strong in it, yes, we are going to keep investing there. We're gonna put more money and more energy. So come up with strategies there. Another one we're gonna do is if the industry attractiveness is medium or average and it's one of our strengths, business unit strengths, yes, we're gonna grow that one. Okay, and then also if it's a high growth industry, but we're only average at it, it's worth going more into it so we can become more powerful. Then we look at hold industries. Now holding, we're just going to try to save our position here. If it's a place where your business unit is very strong, but the industry attractiveness is not too high. Then if you look at it where it's kind of like medium and medium and average industry and our average business unit, we're just going to hold there. And then if it's an attractive business unit, but we're weak in it, we'll hold there, okay? And then the rest, we're gonna harvest, we're gonna get rid of. If it's a below business unit, okay, it's not good for a business unit, and it's an average industry growth, forget it. And if it's bad industry growth, attractiveness, and we're bad at it, forget it. And if it's bad industry growth, and we're really okay at it, forget it. Okay, so the wind's picking up, the rain's coming in, I've gotta go, I apologize for the wind. I hope this helps you give you guys an idea of the GE matrix and how you can use it to decide which business units you should expand and which ones you should contract. If you have any questions on business matters, marketing, all kinds of stuff, or if you wanna learn more about going to the Grand Canyon, check us out on our website at www.waltersworld.com. We're also on Twitter and Facebook. We appreciate all your likes and subscriptions. So bye and see you later from the Grand Canyon in Arizona, USA.